Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lucy Beard. I'm the director here at the Alice Paul Institute. Uh, welcome uh, to Paul. I'm sitting at Paul's Day with Alice Paul looking over my shoulder, as she should all the time. But I, I want to welcome you to our November program, <clears throat> Women and the Election of 2020, Influence and Outcomes. Um, just a quick reminder, we always please watch our website, um, alicepaul.org on the events page. We'll see our upcoming events, uh, which are getting posted as we speak. Our next um, online program is December 12th at 2 p.m. Uh, we'll call it a holiday high tea, for lack of a better word. Um, join us for tea, and we're going to reflect on the year and look forward with optimism to the changes coming in the in the new year and answer any questions you might have for the Alice Paul Institute staff, bring your questions, your suggestions, and we'll toast the end of a very long year <laughs> and share some cheerful thoughts on the next one. Um, and then on January 9th, we'll be have our annual birthday celebration for Alice Paul, whose birthday was January 11th. Um, and our program, uh, we'll, we'll be introducing our new executive director at that meeting. And our program that day is, we'll be viewing a short film, Whispers in the Wind, which explores the roots of the American women's suffrage movement from the Native American Seneca tribes, female leadership traditions. So it's a really fascinating topic and um, one long understudied. So uh, we hope you can join us for those. And just, as I say, watch our social media and watch our, um, we our website for details. Um, so this afternoon, I'm really excited for this program. Um, we had this little thing back at the beginning of the month called an election. You might have heard about <laughs> And there's a lot to talk about with the election. And gosh, it's so the, the conversation continues. But, but one of the things I, for, with this organization and I, we really need to think about is the role of women in this election and where the, how, they, how it turned out for women on all fronts. Um, so I'm excited to welcome our panel, Kelly Dittmar and Jennifer Piscopo. Kelly is an Associate Professor of Political Science at Rutgers University Camden and Director of Research and Scholarship at the Center for American Women and Politics at Rutgers Eagleton Institute of Politics. Her research focuses on gender and American political institutions. She's the co-author of A Seat at the Table, Congresswomen's Perspectives on Why Their Representation Matters. And she's an author of Navigating Gen Gendered Terrain, Stereotypes and Strategy in Political Campaigns. At COP, she manages national research projects, helps to develop and implement the research agenda, and she contributes to COP reports, publications, and analyses. Jennifer Piscopo is Associate Professor of Politics at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Her work explores gender and political representation in the United States, Latin America, and around the globe. She co-edits the journal Politics, Groups, and Identities. She consults regularly for international organizations, including the United Nations, <clears throat> excuse me, and on UN Women, the, excuse me, the groups on UN Women. She, she recently completed a report for the 65th Committee on the Status of Women on the Impact of Women in Public Life. She's a regular commentator on the news media in the US and internationally. So Kelly and Jennifer, welcome. Uh, we have a bi-coastal panel with us this afternoon. And thank you very much, both of you. And um, the floor is yours. I'd just like you to take it away and tell us about women in this election. You want to lead, Jen, or do you want me to oh, go? Oh, Kelly, I think, why don't you show us your, show us your numbers from the right, right. American Women in Politics, and then we'll I'll, go I'll put on my call, Pat. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming. I really, you know, kudos to folks who are thinking about women in politics on Saturday afternoons. Usually, it's just a small cadre of the nerds among us. So I appreciate being with you all virtually. Um, and, and I'm glad we're having this conversation now. Um, if we had had it right after the election, there would have been so much unknown. And I keep saying to folks every day, every week, we know more than we knew before. Um, so we're getting to, to a point where we're seeing a picture of what it's going to look like for women going into 2021 in terms of political representation. So for any of you who aren't familiar with the Center for American Women in Politics, um, we do a number of things, been around for almost 50 years, uh, based in New Jersey. Uh, and uh, one of the things we are probably most known for is just keeping the numbers. Um, 
of women's political representation. So women office holders uh, from the top um, down to state legislative and some municipal offices. Uh, and we also though keep track of women, can women candidates um, and look at how those trends have changed over time. And amidst those, obviously look at different characteristics, um, especially party, race, and ethnicity, and try to look at uh, variants in terms of which women are being represented and where, um, and where do we see continued underrepresentation, which I would say to you is most everywhere um, in, in American politics. So I thought I'd just lay out a couple of things about where we are today in terms of women's political representation. Again, what we will see in 2021. Um, but I won't, I'm gonna leave some things for the conversation, um, but I will show as Jen noted, I have a couple of quick slides that might be helpful. Um, let me do my desktop. You could also see our website. I might show you that later. Um, we're at cawp.ruckers.edu. Uh, um, so what I wanted to show is this, this particular slide. I actually think it's probably the most helpful just to give you a sense of where we are today. So women's political representation, um, as of today at each level of office, uh, this is not including state legislatures. Um, in state legislatures, we are also uh, under 30% in terms of representation, and we are waiting on a lot more results at the state legislative level, but I'll just give you the sense we are probably going to see a, a record level of women's state legislative representation, but we don't expect it to be um, probably not more than a third, um, but if so, you know, within that range of 30 to 35% of women women's political representation um, at the state legislative level. So this speaks to our overall trend, which women are over 50% of the population. They will continue to be far short of that in terms of elected office holders. And the changes that we saw, um, especially at, in the US, at the US House level, are notable and they're important because uh, many of you, I'm sure all of you know that in 2018, women ran for one nomination and one elected office at record levels. Um, there was a lot of discussion of it was a year of the woman. It was an anomaly. Certainly that's not the case. Women ran one nominations and one office at record levels again this year. But the story this year was a partisan one, um, a different partisan one, excuse me. In 2018, we saw the gains happen entirely on the Democratic side. And if you look at the US House again, as probably the best indicator of this trend, 36 women won election, new women won election to the US House in 2018. Of those, just one was a Republican woman. This year, Republican women made up nearly all the gains in terms of candidacies, at the congressional level. So how many women ran this year? Those gains were really happening on the Republican side, partly because you had a lot more Democratic women incumbents. Um, but at the end of the day, the gains also among the newcomers are dominated by Republicans. And so I'll show you one other uh, slide here that's difficult to see the numbers, but I just want you to see the trend. If you look at the purple bar here, um, all the way to the right, that's the 26 new women uh, who have already been elected to the 117th Congress in the US House. Um, of those, 17 are Republican women and nine are Democratic women. Add to this that five Democratic incumbent women lost their election this year. Uh, so while Democrats will see a slight gain in their representation, uh, uh, they will not see nearly the gain that Republican women will in the next Congress. And the last thing I'll say, and then we can continue the back and forth, is that Republican women's gains this year were especially important because in 2018, especially again in the House, they went from just 23 members, already a very small number out of 435, down to 13. This year, they, they will go up to a record level. I think I should have this off the top of my head. They're at 28 um, to, as of today um, in the House. That is a record level. It's the highest Republican women have ever been in the House. Um, it is a larger proportion of the women in the House, and it is a larger proportion of the Republicans in the House next cycle. 
They will continue, however, to be far less represented than Democratic women, both among women and within their party. So there's a really interesting gender story this cycle, I think that is worth talking more about and paying attention to. Um, and we can also, you know, talk more about, of course, the, the, I know we'll talk about Kamala Harris, but just to note that in the Senate, we may actually see a drop in women, but part of that is because we now will have a woman vice president. So it's, it's not a total loss, of course, um, at that level. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me to join all of you today. Like Kelly said, this is actually for me a fantastic way to spend my Saturday. So thank you for sharing it with me. Um, Kelly set up you know, a comment for me really nicely, which I think is a lot of the media stories in the past two weeks really have focused on this record number of Republican women. But I think it's important to realize that there's a record number of Republican women because the floor was so low. Right in the outgoing Congress, right, the current Congress that's on its way out, right? I mean, Democratic women outnumbered Republican women by about six to one. Democratic women were close to 40% of the Democratic House caucus, and Republican women were, I think, about six or seven percent of the Republican House caucus. And so I think that uh, the, the media story sometimes is a little bit misleading because we are talking about Republican women breaking records, but we're actually talking about very marginal gains from a floor that was really low. And even if you look at the candidacy numbers, it's true that some of the record growth in women candidates in 2020 came from the addition of more Republican women running, whereas in 2018, it was a lot of Democratic women running. Again, the floor was really low. And this year, uh, women were about 50% of House nominees, right, Kelly? Did I get that right? Women were about 50% of House nominees in the Democratic Party and still dramatically underrepresented for House nominees in the Republican Party. So I think it's important to situate these gains of Republican women in the context of their overall low representation in the party. And I saw a question come in in the chat, Tani, I don't know if, um, if I'm going out of order, but was sort of asking about the kinds of Republican women that were coming in. And I think it's true that we have seen some examples of Republican women going more to the right of their party in order to win elections. And that wasn't historically always the case, right? Um, Republican women were um, more likely to be, historically, more likely to be slightly more moderate relative to the men in their party. But that's been changing. There's some recent uh, data on looking in the past few years saying, looking at Republican women on abortion, they're actually becoming to the right of their party on abortion issues. They're becoming more conservative relative to their party on abortion issues. And certainly some of the high profile Republican women candidates and now victors in this election cycle were definitely to the right of the party. So I think that also tells us something about the kinds of Republican women that are able to run and win, not just in 2020, but perhaps let's say the last five to 10 years, that they have to sort of overcome the stereotype that women are more likely to be liberal. And in overcoming that, they tack even farther to the right than say a median Republican man. Lucy, did you want us to be also looking at Q&A as we're going? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> you can, please. Um, that I'm, I'm just processing what Jennifer just said. They're actually tacking more conservative just to prove that they can be, <laughs> basically. Right. I mean, and of course, we're speaking, you know, on average, right? Yeah, yeah. Overall trend, it doesn't necessarily explain every Republican congresswoman or senator. Um, but I think that there's a lot of pressure on some of these women to... And, and also a lot of opportunity, right? So what I see sort of now is a lot of Republican women in the past few weeks sort of using the narrative that the Trump team is creating around the election, repeating right. that narrative and using their narrative to build their national brand, right? Doing the media circuit sort of echoing this narrative. So we might also think about an opportunity, right? For Republican women to really hitch their cart to Trumpism, so to speak, that they yeah. can harness those votes and they can harness those movements and they can gain a national profile, right? So there's also an element of strategy here for the women candidates. Yeah. I think Jen's right, but I also think these are genuinely conservative women. Absolutely. In other words, um, and, and to her point, um, 
part of the issue is that if you aren't that conservative, you're not getting to this point to be a congressional, a seriously considered congressional candidate and nominee on the Democratic side. And so one of the things that this also raises uh, for I'm sure probably many on the call um, is really challenging the idea that women are monolithic in their beliefs mm -hmm. about anything, including feminism mm -hmm. and policy. Um, and so certainly on the voter side of things, you know, this became much of the conversation after the 2016 election, um, which was one, what about these white women, right? Why, why did white women support Donald Trump? Um, and certainly those of us who studied this, and again, I'm sure this audience who's interested in women and voting and the vote and the suffrage movement is quite aware that there have been quite conservative women forever and also women, white women, um, have a really uh, problematic history when it comes to not only race and racial issues, um, but also privilege or uh, choosing the privilege of their race over a solidarity around gender. Mm -hmm. um, and so women, white women have been voting Republican for decades. Mm -hmm. 2016 was not new in that. What was surprising, I think, to folks was you had a candidate who was more overtly misogynistic and racist in his rhetoric and, and actions. Um, and I think a disappointment among some that that didn't then pull these women away. But it was also a lesson for us all to think more with greater nuance and complexity about women's political behavior, broadly speaking, to remember that there is this real range of women. And I think we're gonna be confronted with that, um, again, much more explicitly in the next Congress. Already there's a group of conservative women who have uh, titled themselves the Freedom Squad to contrast um, the squad of AOC, mm -hmm. Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, um, and Ayanna Presley. Uh, they did it on the campaign trail. They called themselves the conservative squad. Um, some of them, it's a different group of women, um, but certainly um, they were already leveraging gendered arguments against other women. And so when we think about gender and strategy and politics, um, part of it is also looking at the fact that they engage in that gender performance as well as that gendered strategy, um, sometimes in very different ways, um, even if you know, they are women candidates. And I think one thing to think about what this means moving forward is then where are the spaces of intersection for women despite differing, differing racial ethnic identities and party identities. Because if you set something like abortion aside, right, historically there have been issues where women have been able to cooperate across the party line, right? Violence against women is one example of those, that there can be sort of bipartisan agreement, perhaps not on the nitty gritty of the policy details, but on the idea that, you know, you should develop more robust policies to confront violence against women, there are some other areas where there's also been overlap, right? Women in the military, protecting women in the military. But now if we see, right, as Kelly said, this entrenchment of a particular kind of a gendered performance among Republican women, it's deeply bound up in the partisan identities. And we know that Congress as a whole, right, the polarization has affected the ability of Congress as a whole to move forward on public right. policy more or less for quite some time, right? Becoming very pronounced in the Obama years. So I think one question then becomes where will those areas of intersection of women across party lines be? And is that space being shut down, right? Because the, co the political right. consequences of a freedom squad collaborating with the squad, right? Are going to be much stronger, even right. if there might be some overlapping interests in some policy areas with a gendered perspective. So I think there's consequences, not just for election, but also for the kind of collaborative policy making that seems more and more out of reach of Congress, not just on gendered issues, but on other issues as well. Right, so our hope for the kind of collaboration we saw I don't know, four or five years ago where the women in the Senate were meeting, right. uh, even during the shutdown, we may not uh, hope for that. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I, I have struggled in the last couple of weeks because we wrote a book called A Seat at the Table. We interviewed yeah. women in the 114th Congress and our conclusions, you know, inclu included among our conclusions was 
women across party lines both see themselves as more efficient. In other words, they, you know, are motivated by achievement over ego. In nearly all of our interviews, and we interviewed 83 women in Congress, they said the same thing, like, look, we're here to get work done. And so that does mean working across the aisle. And we were interviewing really conservative women, but they could point to examples where ultimately to sort of Jen's point, like, are there these places? And they could point to those places where they did come together. One of the um, cases that I'm sure folks will be familiar with is um, Carolyn Maloney from New York, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very uh, progressive woman, um, very active on pro-choice issues. Um, mm -hmm. She worked together with Marsha Blackburn, very not <laughs> pro-choice, very, uh, right. is a Congresswoman who doesn't like to be called Congresswoman, right? Like has made it a point to say, I want to be called Congressman. Uh, she's now a senator, but at the time, so her engagement care of that. <laughs> with gender is so different. They mm -hmm. came together to support the National Women's History Museum, mm -hmm. actually to mm -hmm. the somewhat detriment of Marsha Blackburn. She was criticized by those yeah. in her own party because there was the presumption that this was, you know, a feminist endeavor, these liberal academics who want to do this project. <laughs> All of this is to say there was that space. I do worry that some of the conclusions that we came to about women's willingness to work across the aisle, the desire of democratic women uh, at the time, they kept saying, if there were just more Republican women, you know, like then maybe we could find some more common ground because we have shared experiences when it comes to how hard it was to get here, when it comes to being a caregiver and an office holder. And that those were the places where they could really establish relationships and avoid that hyperpolarized environment. But if you are a congresswoman who has campaigned actively against the women in Congress, mm -hmm. those spaces for you to come together are going to be harder. I think there are women in this Republican class who, you know, that for which there is that, that possibility with Democratic women. But I, there's certainly some like a Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lo, Lauren Bo Boebert, that's not, it's not gonna happen. Um, so it may be that, you know, there's some navigation across, again, this diversity of the women who are elected on both sides of the aisle, because there are Democratic women who I don't think are gonna be willing to reach across either in this moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lucy. Quick question: Has the squad been known to reach across the aisle? I'm just curious if you're aware of that happening in the last two years. I don't think they've had. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, a lot of the stuff we don't see behind the scenes. So I don't yeah. want to say yeah. they haven't. Yeah. I right. bet that there have been very few opportunities to, because if you're a Republican right now, and you work with AOC you have an electoral risk. If you looked at the, the, the number one message for Republicans, whether they were women or men in this right. last election was to uh, be anti-socialist, right? right? And it was effective, argue, I would argue yeah. it was effective. Yeah. It was uh, effective in various races that we saw women lose in fact. Mm -hmm. um, the image that was used nine times out of 10 in an ad to say that they were anti-socialist was of at least one member, if not all of the members of the squad. Right. And so the demonization of these women makes it very unlikely that you would ever be both willing to have your name on something with them. And then if you are AOC, Ayanna Presley, I'm not sure you're at all motivated to, to try to reach across the aisle. Um, in, in that sort of really hyper polarized. And of course there was, ex I, sh I was gonna say racial undertones, but they're racial overtones in those right. messages. Right. And so it makes it really hard to, to, to look beyond that. It's not just politics at that point right. um, for them to be willing to work together. Right. I, I think, think that's a quick say, we have a, a question in the chat. What is AOC? Sorry, <laughs> Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez, the representative <laughs> from New York, um, who is also the youngest woman in Congress and Latina. Right. 
Okay, sorry, yes. Jennifer. No, no, I mean, to pick up on this kind of conversation about you know, bipartisanship and women being bipartisan, and I'm seeing some questions come in in the chat that I think are really rightfully pushing us to think about, well, yeah. what does bipartisanship even mean in a context where um, one party is, is taking a stand that has some consequences for the way we think about democracy and democratic legitimacy? And I think that's a really yeah. fair point. And I think there's two comments you know, I, I wanna make about you know, we have evidence, right, as Kelly says, from her research and other people's research about women's, in normal times, let's say, greater tendency to try to look for points of intersection, look for points of collaboration in order to get things done rather than focus on credit taking. At the same time, we also have this sort of gendered expectation that women should be more likely to do these things because we think women are more likely to be collaborative. And so we want to be careful because the kinds of electoral and political and pragmatic calculations that Kelly and I are talking about are not just affecting Republican women, right? They're affecting Republican men and they're affecting the logic of any representative who's Republican at this moment. That's, you know, I'll use this metaphor again, you know, hitch their horse to the cart of this party that as our, you know, audience is pushing us to think about in the Q and A has been playing a kind of political brinksmanship, right? I mean, one of the hallmarks that we think is democratic theorists Hallmarks of democracy at the end of the day is free and fair elections and free and fair elections meaning you recognize that elections were free and fair and so you cede political power to your opponents when you lose. Right? We can argue about more broader expansions of democracy that free and fair elections aren't sufficient, we need a broader package of civil and political rights. But political scientists would say your minimalist definition of democracy is that everyone recognizes that you have free and fair elections and everyone recognizes the results. And what we see is one party not being willing to do that. And I would say not just in the current moment, but going back to the Obama years, right? There was a real sense that um, the Republican party's main mission in the Obama years was to be the party of no, right? To simply be the party that would obstruct Obama's agenda, right? And that might be more likely in a parliamentary system, that might be more sort of the way that it works, but it's not historically been the way it's thought to work in presidential systems. So I think our viewers are absolutely right to sort of push us to say, you know, it's great to have this conversation about bipartisan collaboration, but we also seem to be in a moment, right, where there's a fraughtness about um, democracy, right? There's a fraughtness about whether the vote is even free and fair, and there's a fraughtness about whether one party is prepared to play by the rules of those voting outcomes. And I think that what we're seeing is a product of that. And it's not just women, it's men that are entering into this new political calculation. It's made me think of, Jen, I feel like this is your argument, so I'm stealing it from you, but I have many times also <laughs> and tried to build on it in myself as well. But maybe it's not a direct tangent, but there's also, this is also speaks to the expectations we set for women, office holders, right? Um, and so Jen has written about this and spoken about this, like we have to be careful that in promising that women are better representatives, right? And in making this case, and look, I work at the Center for American Women in Politics. I, we, you know, certainly are advocating for an increase in women's representation and saying, you know, we need more women in office and here are some reasons why. In our book, we say, look, these women say they're, you know, moving, they're here to get things done. We need more of that in politics. Imagine if we had more of that in politics. At the same point, the danger of that is setting up higher expectations for women so that when they come in office, if they don't clean everything up, you know, prevent any scandal, um, make everything work better, get more done, um, work across the aisle, like all of these things that yes, we see as, you know, a democratic ideal, or at least some of us see as a democratic ideal. If women don't do it all, uh, then we risk that people say, well, see, they failed, right? Um, and so I think this also speaks to being careful about our expectations that women are better than men and trying to say that it should be <laughs> that women can be successful candidates and win office at that same level of expectation that men are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and relatedly, 
we shouldn't expect women to save us. And I would say in our recent election, we shouldn't expect black women to save us every time. Um, and so thinking about our expectations and also challenging them, even when you think they're positive, you know, stereotypes or expectations to be careful about that. Right. Speaking of that, we did have a comment in the chat about um, the increased voter mobilization in the African American communities. Is that mobilization activity also reflected in Latina communities? Absolutely. Um, and I would say, you know, there's been a, a really appropriate and important and deep focus in the media narrative about the work of Black Lives Matter, especially the work of um, African American women leading voter turnout organizations in Georgia, Stacey Abrams being the most well known, but not the only right. one. Um, but all of that same work has also been happening among Latina and Latina voters. And we know that this mobilization is actually primarily done by women. So if we pivot to a state like Arizona, right, it was Latina women um, that were working not just in the most recent election, but building up their voter mobilization turnouts for decades to really drive mobilization. They're fueled in Arizona by a new generation of Latino, Latina, and Latinx youth, right, that sort of grew up in a state that had passed really restrictive anti-immigrant legislation, were mobilized by that. Um, and the other important difference in Arizona and elsewhere in the Southwest has also been Native American communities, Native American women, and the barriers to voting for Native Americans are enormous. The way states have attempted to disenfranchise the Native American vote are enormous, right? In 2018, um, states tried to make, voter, make it a requirement that you had a physical address to vote, which disenfranchised a lot of Native Americans who use post office boxes as their mailing addresses, right? Because they live on reservations. So there's all these layers, right, which states use to try to block the vote of people of color, indigenous peoples, Latinos, black Americans. And I think that, you know, we see that the barriers they overcome to vote. I mean, imagine what the electoral outcomes in Arizona or Georgia would look like if there were none of these barriers to voter registration, yeah. right? Imagine okay. what the vote of people of color in those states would be. And so yeah. one of the things that I have been pushing back a lot to, um, less so in the media and more just in my private conversations in the past few weeks has also been this idea, right? This narrative that, okay, well, the Democrats won the election, but they didn't win by the expected landslide. I mean, I think that itself is debatable. But if we just take that for a moment, then the conversation goes, well, what are Democrats you know, doing to sort of win back white moderates? And I would say, wait a minute, as a political scientist, one of the things you do when you win an election is reward your winning coalition. So what are Democrats doing to support the women and the women of color that really handed the vote to Democrats in decisive states like Arizona and Georgia? I mean, I think that's another way to ask the question. And I think it's an important way to ask the question um, because this is a core base for the Democratic Party, not just women, but it's women and people of color. And we also need to say, well, what is the Democrats doing for them, right, in addition to the voters that they quote unquote lost? <laughs> yeah. Right, right, wow. wow. I, just a quick aside, and if this is too far off track, just reel me in, but I'm curious about here in Southern New Jersey, we, it's not uncommon to see a man run for Congress who may not even live in the district, but might have a shore house or something like that in the district, who is self-funding, you know, these millionaires. Is this happening among the women? Were some of those Republican women self-funded or how's their fundraising going? Do they tend to be underfunded or, you know? So, I mean, I can speak to the self-funding piece to a certain extent, at least at the congressional level where you would be more likely to see it um, and the gubernatorial level. Uh, what are, as of today, the yeah. women who have been those self-funders. So you think in New Jersey of somebody like John Corzine or um, our current governor, um, Governor Murphy, right? Um, there are not parallels that of women who have done it and won. So in California, Meg yeah. Whitman, not successful. Yeah. Carly Fiorina for the Senate, not successful. Um, uh, gubernatorial candidate uh, Mary Burke in Wisconsin who ran for governor. She was uh, COO, I think, of Trek Bicycles. Oh, yeah, not yeah, yeah. Uh, Linda McMahon ran for the Senate in Connecticut, self-funded, not successful. I think that when we look at 
um, the different standards to which women are held as candidates. Where we see the greatest gender biases, right? On the campaign trail in evaluation, yeah. right? Not necessarily at the ballot box. Yeah. At the end of the day, women do win, they're successful. There's not a, 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 any clear gender pe penalty at the ballot box. But the questions and evaluations and scrutiny that they face along the way, I think applies here as well because self-funded women get attacked on being self-funded, uh, get scrutinized in other ways. Not that men don't, but they seem to, to ultimately be able to overcome that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I don't know of a lot of hard empirical analyses of these particular mm -hmm. women and, and what went wrong. I could speak the stories, um, but yeah. I think that it is important to note that this has not to date been a very successful route um, to mm. office for women, which is interesting because there are discussions of, you know, the challenges for women to raise money. Uh, you know, the, the empirical research would say women raise as much as men, if not more in some elections, especially in comparable elections. So if it's a really competitive election, somebody like Elizabeth Warren can raise just as much or more than a man who was running in that difficult Senate race the first time she won. But what's missed in that that number, the fact that she raised more or raised equal amounts are two things. One, were there challenges in her getting to that level of fundraising that her male counterpart did not have? Did she raise it in smaller amounts? Did she have to ask more? I've talked to a lot, I've talked to a lot of fundraisers who say, I've never, you know, they compare it to men and women they've worked for. And they say, whenever I've worked for a woman, the donors demand all this access to her. Like they want to talk directly to her, right? They, so there are greater expectations Expect along the way. Yeah. The second issue is, and this is um, great work in, in political science by our colleagues who've looked at, does it take more money for a woman to achieve the same result? So if you are, are on the campaign trail and you have to answer to all these doubts about your qualifications and challenges to your ethics and all of these things that are, have been particularly gendered, does that actually take more money? And therefore getting to the same amount of money as their male colleagues might not actually mean you don't have a fundraising challenge. Uh, so I think those are just interesting things to think about when we think about money in, in candidacy. I was thinking, Kelly, as you were talking, right, I mean, there are, you know, we, we see the evidence of sort of some gendered stereotypes and gendered ideas, even if they might not affect the overall rate at which women win. And so I'm thinking about the great research by our colleagues, right, that when we think about political ambition, it shows that men are much more likely to think about political office as something they would just always do, like they just always wanted to do it. Right, and that women are more likely to think about political office when they see a need or a demand or a right. change that right. they wish to make. How does that relate to my reflection on Kelly's comments about fundraising? I think that it's this sort of double standard where when a woman self funds her campaign, it becomes seen as a vanity campaign, right? And we think yeah. about the ambitious, the ambition penalty that women pay. Whereas if a man self funds his campaign, well, men were always going to run for office, so mm -hmm. sure, of course they're going to self fund their campaign. I think there's also an element, and we see this. Um, elsewhere when we work with women candidates, I also work with women candidates in Latin America, that um, when women put their own resources into their campaign, they're seen as taking from the household income. They're seen as taking from income that benefits <laughs> their families in ways that when men put their own resources into their campaign, they're not. I think another though important part about money, Kelly um, talked really great about women, uh, like women candidates getting money, um, I want to talk about the role of women donors, because what we have seen since Clinton's candidacy is an increasing power of women as donors to political mm. campaigns. So mm. historically, women didn't donate as much as men to campaigns. We could think about a variety of gendered reasons why, perhaps similar to this idea of you know, family resources and how women versus men might use family, family money. Um, but you know, Hillary Clinton's campaign was really bankrolled by women. It was also staffed by a lot of women. So we see women as donors and we see women as sort of activists and foot soldiers and volunteers. And in the most recent elections, like women again broke new grounds as donors, right? And as big ticket donors. Um, they're not on parity with men yet, but we see increasingly numbers of women that are donating to candidates and donating to political action committees. And I think that's another 
important gender difference in political participation, um, where women are starting to equalize their voice and their power, and it's through actually giving money, right? And that, that matters. Yeah. yeah, we have some good questions in the Q&A that I'm being negligent here. Amy asks, how competitive were the seats where the Republican women ran this time? And did they primarily win in districts that were safe Republican districts, or did they actually win over you know, in a close one over Democrats. So if I can give, so I'm gonna give a shout out. So this is Amy Benner, who is um, one of our research assistants at the Center for American Women in Politics, um, who has done really incredible work to make sure we know this and other information about candidates this cycle. And so I'm glad, thank you, Amy, for raising this. <laughs> Nine of the, um, Republican women who won um, as non-incumbents this cycle flipped seats. So they flipped a seat from Democrat to Republican. Yeah. Of those nine, four of them flipped seats from Democratic women who flipped seats mm -hmm. in 2018. What uh, that says is these are very competitive districts. Mm -hmm. And I this, this point is really, um, useful for us to think about going into the next cycle. In 2018, Democratic women were responsible for flipping the House, arguably, right? Because they flipped, of the, of the flipped seats from Republican to Democrat, the majority were won by women. So think right. about women like Abigail Spanberger, Haley Stevens, um, uh, in uh, Oklahoma, right? The, this race that was lost this time, Kendra Horn. Um, I could go down the list, right? So there are the, these women who won these seats that were very difficult to win in 2018, but they benefited from a year that they were good candidates. It was also a democratic year. We get to 2020, leading into the election, no matter how many people wanna tell you now that they knew what was gonna happen, they didn't. All of the predictions were that these seats were not gonna go to Republicans, that this was not gonna be a particularly good year for Republicans in the House. Well, it turns out it was better than expected. Why does that matter for women? Because these women were in those seats that would only yield a victory were it a good year or a better than expected year for Republicans. So I was the naysayer going in saying, it's gonna be hard for these Republican women to win because they're situated in these really difficult districts. Well, I was proven wrong as were a lot of other people because these districts broke for them. Yeah. What this means in 2022 is again, women on both sides of the aisle will be in the most vulnerable districts. Um, and so it is not to discount the win, but it is to say that we also need women to win in these really safe districts if we wanna preserve women's representation um, in the long term and their seniority over time. And I will say of those um, new Republican women, there's 17, some of those are certainly in safer districts, but nine of them are in these flip districts. Hmm. Um, another question, and this, this might be pretty esoteric. Should we support more liberal men as opposed to conservative women? What's your I'll opinion? I'll Jen take that. I, I have an oh, institutional affiliation. <laughs> um, you know, this, I think this is a tough question, right? Because I mean, I take seriously, you know, the comments that, you know, are coming through in the chat that are, are really sort of, you know, questioning us to think about the particular moment that we're in where, again, we have one party that's not recognizing the rules of democracy. Um, we have one party that's sort of fairly showing itself to be opposed to democracy in certain ways. And so that, you know, the stakes seem quite higher in this moment when we right. think about right. politics and ideological choices, right? right. Um, but, you know, I think if we, if we step back from that, that moment, you know, I, you know, for me, going back to the argument that, that Kelly pointed out that I make a lot, which is about the danger of, of arguing for women's presence based on the consequences that women should do politics better, right? I think a better argument is that women have political power for reasons of justice, for reasons of fairness and for reasons of equality, because we, we don't demand that those results from men the way we do of women, because we put more on men. So, you know, I think from a justice and equality perspective, you know, women have the right to hold positions of power, no matter their ideologies. What we should be as good citizens in a democracy doing is demanding 
better representation from all of our leaders, whether they are men or women. And if they're not delivering, we need to vote them out, right? So I think that it's this, this trade-off between we're in a fraught political moment, um, the choices, right, between conservative and progressive politics feel really consequential, um, but there's also a question, you know, those Republican women, they ran, they won their seats, um, they have a right to, to hold that seat, right? So I think people have to navigate this according to their own principles. Right. And if I could speak to that for a second, there's also, it, it, this gets to, you know, our definitions of what representation means. And so certainly substantive representation on interests, uh, I think sort of to Jen's point, your version of what women's interests are, are going to be different than what other women believe are in women's best interest and whether or not men can work towards them and support them in ways better than other women or not. Mm -hmm. But I do, I'm sort of, Harkening back to, so um, Jane Mansbridge, a political scientist, uses this idea of uncrystallized interest that I often think is really important for us to consider in representation, which is what happens on the issues that we can't even fathom right now. We're electing somebody, but we don't know the, all the issues that are going to confront them. For example, two years or two plus years ago, we didn't know that this Congress was going to be dealing with coronavirus. So how important was it that when this hit, we had, for example, black women in Congress who were saying, this is disproportionately happening to our communities. We right. understand quite innately how these communities work and what we need to do in terms of healthcare. And I'm not saying they've been quite successful because they've been battling against uh, a Republican Senate and a, a president who's not acting on it. But certainly thinking about the things that you wouldn't even know we're going to be essential to not just have somebody who cares about this issue, but somebody who understands through lived experience or networks or connections in a community, um, the difference in how this policy will affect different individuals or the, the history. And so this is where we need to value, I think, um, lived experience and perspective that do come from gender and race, gender identity, right? Things that you navigate the world, which we know is not equal on those axes. And so you bring something distinct to office. We are very comfortable as a country talking about the value of having a veteran in office or somebody who um, was in law enforcement or somebody who's a doctor. But why wouldn't we see expertise and lived experience in being a woman or an indigenous woman or being uh, a mother, right? That that too right. brings distinct experience that again, we may not even know the value of in, until we get right. into these debates and conversations. And I just wanna say one other thing so that we don't leave without noting this about that. In terms of women of color in, and representation, we will see a record level of uh, women of color in the next Congress. They will be more Republican than they have ever been before. We have five new, uh, or five, we will have five Republican women of color, which is not a lot at all. But just to say that that's a record high. Um, and even still, um, as of today, and even in the next Congress, I think we go down by one or two, but as of today, 26 states have never sent a woman of color to Congress, 27 states have never sent a woman of color to the U.S. House, 46 states have never sent a woman of color to the U.S. Senate, <laughs> and currently five women of color, or five women of color have ever served in the U.S. Senate compared to the 69 white men that currently serve there. So when we think about representation as well along the intersections of race and gender to also consider the dearth of representation of right. many women of different racial and ethnic groups. Um, we will have no black women in the next Senate should one not be appointed by Governor Newsom. Right. Um, you know, we, we have two Native American women currently in Congress that were first elected in 2018. I could go on, but the point being, we have to think about these uh, identities as, as equally important and valued um, in, in office. Right. Right. I can pick up on some, some another sort of optimistic read on this um, that might 
be a different way of answering the question, should we support liberal men or conservative women? I mean, we know from the academic research that's been conducted not just in the United States, but across the globe, right? We know that when there are more uh, women in office, uh, voters and citizens in those countries are more likely to perceive their governments as democratic, legitimate, and fair. So we actually know that, that even if citizens, individual citizens don't always behave that way at the ballot box, we know that there's sort of an aggregate overall relationship um, between the diversity of one's representatives and whether or not citizens feel that they live in a country that's, that's democratic. And my co-authors and I have actually shown this for the United States um, in our research where we've shown that when citizens are confronted with legislatures that are gender balanced versus legislatures that are all male, that they feel more positively towards the gender balanced legislature or the gender balanced group. They think that group is more likely to make trustworthy, reliable and fair yeah. decisions. So we see a connection between women's presence and the way people think about the quality of democracy. And if you look at autocrats elsewhere in the world or would be autocrats elsewhere in the world, I'm thinking about Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. I'm thinking about Viktor Orban in, in Hungary. One of the first things they do when they get into power is reduce the opportunities for women to also hold political power. Right, so after the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, the interim president appointed an all white, all um, European origin cabinet, right? So women were immediately moved from positions of power. So one way you know, that we can think about um, supporting the democratic ideals that many of us feel are under threat, right? And when I say democratic ideals, I mean dem democracy as a system, not the democratic party, right? Is we can continue to support having women in office. And I'll say the other side that our research shows is also that people on both sides of the aisle don't like tokens, right? So it's not necessarily the case, right? So it's not necessarily the case um, that some of these Republican women that we started off the conversation with are going to produce these kinds of legitimizing effects that I talked about, because if people know that they're just token women, I think that term is problematic for all kinds of reasons, but mm -hmm. if people know that they're just token women, that the legitimi legitimizing effects will be reduced, right? So that's actually why, you know, a, the, the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett didn't have the legitimizing effects, even though she was a woman, because people saw that as a process that was tokenizing rather than genuinely elevating her um, for reasons of her, her background. Right. So I think that um, there are reasons to support women, no matter their ideologies and their backgrounds, and they have to do with these bigger picture reasons of not every individual woman will be a little D Democrat, right? There's plenty of Marjorie Taylor Greens, but in the aggregate, right, the group of women does have an effect on how citizens perceive their political system. Right. Believe it or not, we have someone from Brazil on this call. <laughs> No, Larissa, I saw Larissa's message pop up. Larissa's absolutely right, right? You don't know, but like the flip side is what would, right? Again, but I think that goes to my point about the token women, right? Mm -hmm. What women would want, to, would have in that context wanted to be the token women just so that the group of legislators that impeached Dilma right. Rousseff could pretend that they weren't, that they were feminists after all, right? right. So I think that right. we, can, we can bridge it together there. <laughs> right. If I can look ahead, um, I selfishly, because I've got someone from California here, want to know who will, how does it work to replace a senator in California? What is the process? Um, so Governor Newsom will get that honor. And um, points, Governor Newsom is on record as saying he would not wish this task on his worst enemy um, because there are so many high profile, super qualified, diverse, Democratic politicians in California who would love a shot at that seat, right? There we have, we basically have an embarrassment of riches in the state, you know? Yeah. And so I, you know, when, when Newsom said, I wouldn't wish this job on my worst enemy, it was mean that he has an embarrassment of riches. Right. And right. That there are constituencies that, that want to see Karen Bass, right? As the first black woman. Um, there's constituencies that would like to see a Latina woman, a native woman, a black man, right? Um, we have so many, qualified Democratic leaders, mm -hmm. many of whom have national ambitions and they want that seat, right? And so I think that um, it, I don't envy the governor his choice, you know, yeah. I, I understand his gallows humor about it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know who he's going to pick. I mean, I think when I just think of, of who I would put on the short list, 
I'm not deeply in the day-to-day -day of California politics and I can come up with 10 names, all of whom I as a California voter would be delighted to see. Um, so yeah. it, it's not gonna be an easy pick. <laughs> Is it a two year or four year? Oh. I believe they'll serve out the rest of Harris's term Which and then have a chance to two run. more years. Kelly, do you know how long her term is? I'm just trying to remember when she was last reelected. I think it's two years. 2016. Yeah. yeah. So they, they would serve out the remainder of remainder of Harris. Right. Term, right. And, and then have to run. Right. But, and but I think people also think if Diane Feinstein retires, you know, we could really have an open contest here in California, right, for those seats. So I would yeah. I would also note that. To Jen's point, a lot of these folks are openly campaigning for it. So, Barbara, oh, yeah. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, which I just think the the, sim, the the symbolism of this, and I don't mean as a black woman. So, Barbara Lee, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, worked for Shirley Chisholm, mm -hmm. the first black woman elected to Congress. She was on her campaign. She continued to work for her. She then became a congresswoman herself. She is, you know, among you know, the sort of leaders, uh, especially on issues re related to gender equity, racial equity in the house, which is very well respected. Um, for her to take that seat because Kamala Harris became yes. the first yes. uh, black woman and South Asian woman to be vice president and wo woman, sorry, to be vice president. Yes. There's just something full circle about, you know, the yes. working for the first black woman who ran for president. Yes. Um, and then having that. So again, my, I don't have a sort of, you know, endorsement, but I do think that right. that's interesting. And she has, she tweeted out yesterday, the day before that she would gladly accept, you know, this position. And so I think that's important. And it also speaks to uh, somebody on the Q and A was also talking about, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, give a return on inv the investment of black women who've right. been so, uh, loyal in terms of their reliability as voters and uh, campaign personnel, uh, volunteers, right? They've been so key to democratic politics. Um, certainly, I think the selection of Kamala Harris was viewed by the, the party and the ticket as one way to sit, to return on that investment. But I, I think this will also be the pressure that Governor Newsom obviously is facing. And you know, our governor himself has national political ambitions. So he, he really doesn't want to mess this up, right? So, you know, this is a really um, a really tough, a really tough moment for him. <laughs> right, right. Um, also looking ahead, uh, we had a question about what types of legislation do you think these incoming women will help advance, part regardless of party, you know, just well, I, I wanted to, you know, make a connection here to, to Alice Paul, right? And so in addition to her role in suffrage, as this group knows, <laughs> right, Alice Paul was foundational in writing the Equal Rights Amendment that's been introduced in Congress, right, ever, ever since Paul's era. And so I think this brings us back full circle to some of the questions where we started, because I think certainly among the, so for folks that don't know, right, the Equal Rights Amendment has been revived, right, because in the past three years, three state legislatures, um, Add, it became the last three states needed to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. And now it's sort of wrapped up in court uh, on the question of whether the initial ratification deadline that Congress imposed can still hold or whether these three states right. that ratified in 2017 and 2018 were actually enough to, to push the Equal Rights Amendment over the finish line. Um, and so I think that you know, before the election, folks that were really paying attention to the Equal Rights Amendment, I mean, feeling like it was still an important addition to the Constitution, hoped that with a Democratic president and a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, that um, notwithstanding <laughs> the current battle over the state by state rat ratification, that maybe the Equal Rights Amendment could be reintroduced and could actually pass Congress and we could have, you know, right. a fresh round of attempts at state level ratification. Um, that might have been something in an era where the parties didn't look like they looked now that perhaps Republican women would have would have joined for, right? But of course, the opposition to the ERA that bogged it down in the 80s and has dogged it ever since has been whether the ERA would create a constitutional right to abortion. So I'm far more skeptical than now than I would have been, you know, three weeks ago about perhaps the Equal Rights Amendment moving forward. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't look like the Democrat, we don't know about the Senate yet, right? right. We don't know how right. close the Senate's going to be. Um, so I think that's one issue that might've been on the table and is now maybe not going to be on the table. 
Um, I think certainly our, our audience might know that the United States is one of the few countries in the world that has never ratified the 1979 United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And certainly there was hope that a Democratic president with a Democratic Senate and then a Democratic majority on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee could finally take up ratification of the International Convention on Women's Rights. But again, I think that's now sort of open, open-minded. So those are my big picture um, discussions that Kelly might have a little bit more of the nitty gritty. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's really, um, and this, this actually speaks to our expectations for women office holders. I usually get calls January you know, 4th, um, the day after women swear in about, well, what are they gonna get done in the next two months? And I think uh, we don't know. And, and the dynamics of this next Congress are going to be probably difficult to what um, Jen has pointed to in terms of partisan division. And I don't, I think there will be fewer spaces for women qua women. In other words, you know, whether it be the Democratic Women's Caucus or even the Republican women who will still be, by the way, about 13% of their caucus um, mm -hmm. to really um, be able to push through both chambers and to the president some of these key policy initiatives that they have been advocates for. Um, so I think we just have to be realistic about that. And, and on the flip side, really pay attention to, in these debates, what role do women and their diverse perspectives play? So watch the floor speeches, watch the press releases, look at the ways in which they ask different questions. Um, to me, those are the more valuable ways in which we see the influence and importance of women, even if I can't tell you, well, because women are in X policy is going to pass. Right. I think it's, it's looking more at the nuance. And by the way, that will be true at the presidential level as well, not only because Kamala Harris will be at the most important decision making tables, in this next administration, but also we we expect that the cabinet will be, if not uh, a gender parity cabinet, close. Um, right. And we're already seeing in terms of the high level staff, people who are highly influential in agendas um, and, and decisions, also diverse in both along gender and racial lines thus far. And so we'll continue to, to see the ways in which that might make a difference in what comes out of this White House and what comes out of Congress. I would say in addition to diversity. Oh, I just want to say in addition to the diversity, Biden is choosing people who have deep experience yeah. in yeah. international politics. They are experts. They are well vested. They know the issues. They know what's been on the agenda for a long time. And I think that if nothing else, the one hopeful thing that I take, you know, as a political scientist who actually believes that experts can manage government well, right, is that we're going to see the return of experts, right? We're going to see the return right. of people with deep levels of competence um, to head up some of these executive agencies and all of these, you know, initiatives. And I think that is optimistic in that sense. Right, right. Yeah, you get a sense of some competence. Does that, re does that diversity in his inner circle reflect um, Biden? Has he always been that way? Or is he responding to the times and realizing I got to do this? You know, I'm just curious if he has a history of working with a having a diverse staff um i don't know enough about his history when he was in the senate in terms of his makeup jen may know um but i i, I would suggest it's probably both in other words i think he has improved over time as we've seen um you know you can go back to the uh crime bill and his commentary there you can go back to the nita hill hearings where he dropped the ball. I mean, that's my opinion. I mean, he, he did not advocate in a feminist way during right. that hearing. And he can use right. it in many ways yeah. for political yeah. reasons, but certainly that was not a feminist. Um, and so I think he has learned. He has been educated by others, especially mm -hmm. uh, women. He worked for the uh, president who um, that administration had some issues with representation as well. Um, the Obama administration was not perfect um, when it came right. to representation of women and people of color, um, but certainly, you know, saw firsthand the value of that. And so, and then I think he is certainly, he is under pressure from active uh, party members and activists outside of the party to really speak to this moment. And this moment includes a racial justice movement, uh, reckoning with um, misogyny and gender inequity within our institutions. And so I think if he wants to sort of 
live up to the expectations, mm-hmm. these things are certainly pressures on him. I think Kelly's assessment is right. And I think that it also speaks to the fact that people can change and that they can genuinely, I because I also think Biden has, has sort of genuinely recognized the importance of these issues, right? He might not have, you know, at earlier moments of his political career, um, but certainly his support now feels sort of heartfelt and, and genuine. And I think it shows the power of activism to, to produce these sorts of changes in our leaders. And it shows the power of people to, to I don't want to use the word evolve, but I guess I'll use the word evolve, right? To, to become better allies, better supporters, better agents of change themselves. And I think we have to give people that space um, to change, to correct the errors of their ways, to be pushed by activists, to take stronger stances on equality and diversity and inclusion. And I think we're seeing the results of that. And I think we should celebrate that both Biden's transformation and the work of all of the women and the people of color and the women of color who pushed him along the way to have him more accountable to those constituents. I think that's important. Right. We have two two quick, I think, quick questions. I'm mindful of your time. Um, Someone asked about statehood for Puerto Rico and Washington. Do you think it can happen? And how would that might impact women um, representation in Congress? I'll do a quick answer on the, so how would affect women's representation? The two delegates from from both of those places in Congress are in fact women. So you would, assuming they would continue their roles, you would get two more votes for women. Uh, However, this is a Republican woman and a a Democratic woman. The uh, other piece though is it's dependent on the Senate. Yeah. And certainly Puerto Rico has a long history of women's leaders. Puerto Rico has had a woman governor, um, the mayor of San Juan, um, and she sort of had her moment of national fame and stood up to Trump um, and the embarrassed, and I will say racist on the record, I'm not embarrassed, right? That was a racist way the administration responded to the Mm -hmm. devastation of Hurricane Maria a few years ago. Um, So hard to say, but I mean, Puerto Rico certainly has a a track record of supporting very strong women leaders um, who have have been on the progressive side of of the spectrum. Um, But statehood for Puerto Rico is really complicated and it's not necessarily the case that every Puerto Rican thinks it would be the best idea, right? So there's a lot of domestic politics on the island that also affect um, what Puerto Ricans might want. I think and that are not necessarily supporting statehood. Yeah, it's it's not, it's not clear whether they have a majority um, or not for statehood. Right. And I think there's there's arguments made by really people who care about the future of Puerto Rico that are that are good faith arguments that are made on both sides. So I think it's a little more fraught for Puerto Rico than it is maybe for DC. But I don't live in DC, so I don't want to comment on <laughs> on, on, DC, yeah. on DC folks's you know yeah, right. Theory. Kelly has a sense of it more than I do. Right. And then Mary had a question I thought was interesting. There are funds, there's one in New York State, she points out, um, funding Republican women to run for office. Is there a, do the Democrats have funds like that? Yeah, I saw this question and I was going to be like, yes. Uh, So (laughs) Emily's List, I would you know, say, uh, so Emily's List, for those who don't know, um, is a national, a national organization that supports pro-choice democratic women candidates. And they do so across levels, their spending is predominantly at the gubernatorial and congressional level. Um, Without going into the whole history of Emily's List, but was really a pioneer in this space, what they effectively were able to do is get to the point where the party at first is not taking them seriously, right? Like, oh, these women are creating this fund, great, that's nice. They now raise millions of dollars and give millions of dollars or or spend millions of dollars, I should say, because it's not all direct giving. They're also doing independent expenditures to the point that now, if you're a Democratic Party leader, you are actively recruiting women, not necessarily because you think women are so great and important to your party. Maybe you also think that um, you should, but because they come with millions of dollars from Emily's list. And so if you don't recruit a woman, that millions of dollars goes away. Um, the, the Emily's List is not giving to a pro-choice Democratic man. So they are the most prominent on the left, but there are other versions of Emily's List, a lower level. Um, there are other leadership packs like Senator Gillibrand's. 
uh, called Off the Sidelines that also targets and supports women. The support infrastructure financially for Democratic women is so much more robust than it is on the right, which is why Elise Stefanik problematized this after 2018, did try to do this work with her leadership pack. But I will say to you, I've taken a quick look at the money from EPAC, Winning for Women, another organization for Republican Women, View PAC, which has been around. If you go to the Center for Responsive Politics and you look at the amount of money they spent in the last campaign in 2020, and you look at the amount of money that Emily's has spent, it's not comparable. And that makes it that much harder for Republican women. Because they're fighting, right, I mean, Kelly, you know, they're fighting this idea, right, for, for, for the Democrats to vote for a woman because she's a woman is sort of part of the party's ideology because the party mm. is committed to diversifying and representation, right? And so, you know, we talk so much about candidates' merits and qualifications, and I'm really indebted to my, my co-author, Susan Franceschette, who makes this point, which is that, you know, your, your identity, your gender, your race identity is also part of your merit and your qualifications for the reasons that Kelly highlighted, right? That people of diverse backgrounds and diverse lived experiences, when they're in that policy room, they make policy better and stronger. So for the Democrats, that's a really easy sell, right? But it's totally anathema in the Republican Party to say that you should support a candidate because their racial or ethnic or gender identity is part of their qualifications, right? And so the Republican, there are many Republican women like Stefanik that are deeply committed to seeing more women, but making that argument goes against their party platform. Right. And so they are really trapped by their party's sense here. And so it's difficult for them to raise money just to give to women, whereas that's been a winning strategy for the Democrats, right? right? right. Yeah. You know, I've been, in 2020, I've been thinking a lot about this picture of Alice Paul behind me. Um, August 18th, she's just gotten the word that Tennessee has has ratified the 19th Amendment. She knows it's, it's in the bag, it's done. And she goes out and poses for this publicity shot, but then sits down and gives a long interview with the Washington Times that appears under a banner headline the next day. And her message was, this is just the first step. We have a long way to go toward equality. And that's what led her to the ERA within the next two years. But her point was, we need to, women need to see themselves as a voting block. They need to consider women's considerations first and foremost. And I think we all agree that a century later, we still don't. But most women are not running, thinking about the women's agenda first and foremost. And I think one of the paradox, right, of, of some studying women as voters and women as candidates is mm -hmm. that they're both always picking out these aggregate trends, but then always unpacking the variation below the aggregate mm -hmm. trend, right? So if we think about all the work that, you know, POP has done around, say, the gender gap, right? So we know that there's a, a trend where, you know, women more than men will vote for the Democratic candidate, right? But then we also know that that is intersected with race and it's intersected with education and it's intersected with rural urban divides. So it's, I think, and the suffragists, right, were attuned to this because of course they wanted the vote to give women influence over policy, right? Because, right. you know, you know, as I don't need to tell at a group at the Alice Paul Institute about this, right? But, you know, this idea that you wouldn't overturn married women's property rights unless women had the vote. At the mm -hmm. moment where the temperance movement and the suffragist movement were really aligned, right? It was about, you know, passing temperance laws would depend on the women's vote, right? It, there was a moment actually where the suffragists and abolitionists were really aligned until mm -hmm. the Reconstruction Amendments, right. right? And abolition and suffrage were seen as, as both essential for equality. And so there's the aggregate trend, right? Women who sort of argued for the vote to protect their interests, to affect laws at a different historical moments, whether it's married women's property rights, temperance, or later in the 1920s, maternal child health, where women have, have sort of said, we need the vote for this shared interest, but then there's also always been the differences, right, where women's interests based on class and race right. haven't been the same. And so I think those of us who study this are constantly trying to walk both those lines, right? That yeah. there's this imaginary of women as a unified group, and we, we see perhaps empirical evidence where that might be true, but then it's also the contesting of that imaginary and thinking about women as diverse as, as men. Right. Um, Right. So I was reading Ellen Carol Dubois' excellent historical account of suffrage recently, um, and one of the points that she makes about why 
reconstruction um, that suffragists couldn't add women's vote to the vote for black men in the reconstruction moment was that actually the Republican party, right? That was the, at the moment the, the party that, that had won the civil war and freed the slaves, the Republican party didn't see women as enough of a block the way they saw black men as a block, right? So black men were of course going to vote for the Republican party, but it was right. in fact right. the inability of women to be conceived as a block that made it harder for suffragists at that moment to add women's suffrage to the yeah. reconstruction amendments, right? Because it wasn't clear how women would line up. Right, but right. it's quite clear how black men would line up. So again, I think it's that tension, right, between yeah, the universal yeah, 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 yeah. and then the difference. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, I We have been abusive of your time and I thank you. This was fascinating and you can tell by the chat and the questions, everyone really has enjoyed this. I can't thank you enough. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll end it there, but thank you. I wish everyone a happy, happy Thanksgiving. As I speak, there are wild turkeys circling my car out in the parking lot, <laughs> looking at themselves and their, their reflections in my car. Um, if only they knew the season. Anyway, this was a wonderful afternoon and I wish both of you a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Thank you. Please thank join you. us again. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was so much fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.